Why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? Welcome to The Internet Says It's True, a show where we learn something new every week, part of the WCBE podcast experience. Great news, everyone. We've been nominated for the Columbus Podcast Awards. Now, we're in the arts category because there's apparently no history or education categories, so find us there. Make sure you vote. You can vote all the way up until August 6th of 2021, and then they close the voting. Go to columbuspodcastawards.com slash nominations. The link is in the show notes. If you have a good ear, you'll notice that my voice sounds slightly different today. That's because I'm recording this episode in a hotel room while I'm on the road. I'm in Scranton, PA, home of Dunder Mifflin, performing a couple magic shows up here for the summer camps in the Poconos. And oh, this is exciting. You can now listen to this podcast on the NPR One app. It's super easy. Just download the NPR One app and set your station to WCBE 90.5 FM and you'll be all set. Now, let's find out today's topic. Hey, Michael, it's Brian from Connecticut. Now, this isn't something I've learned, but it's something I've wondered. Why do I occasionally see pine trees on top of buildings that are under construction? Thanks so much. Love the show. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Yeah, I have seen this, and in fact, I just saw one flying into the Tampa airport last weekend, and I have to admit, other than just assuming it's a tradition, I didn't know anything about it. So I spent a few days researching it for you to find out. On November 27th of 1970, a 60-foot-tall white spruce was cut down in Coventry, Vermont, and hauled to New York City. It was the 38th Christmas tree to be decorated at Rockefeller Center in Midtown Manhattan. They trimmed it with 10,000 red, green, blue, amber, and clear 7-watt light bulbs and finished the decorating on December 10th. But two weeks later, another momentous pine tree was put up in New York City. It wasn't 60 feet tall, it was closer to 20 feet tall, but it was placed inside a steel frame hanging from a 36-foot-long, 4-ton steel column. The column was adorned with a giant American flag and hoisted with a crane to the top of the 1,350-foot-tall building, the world's tallest building at the time. It marked the final steel beam in the construction of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. You may have noticed occasionally that when you drive by a building being constructed that the top of the building will be decorated with a small tree, sometimes along with a flag. Well, it has everything to do with tradition. It's part of a ceremony called topping out, and it's usually part of a ritual that construction companies celebrate. It marks the raising of the highest beam, or sometimes the final beam, of a new building project, the apogee of the new construction's height. Sometimes it will be a steel beam with hundreds of signatures written on it, signatures from the many people who worked on the construction. In the USA, there will often be an American flag hanging from the beam. And if you look closely, you'll probably see a small tree. It's usually, but not always, an undecorated evergreen tree. The tree is usually left up for a few weeks and unceremoniously removed when construction needs to continue around it. But why? What does it mean? We'll get to that after I tell you about a couple products that I love. As I said earlier, I'm currently traveling, and uh, the number one item that goes in my pack is my lightweight Tropiformer jacket. In fact, I had it with me today because I was hiking in the Poconos today uh, doing some photography. I'm, I'm on an off day in between shows, and it's been raining on and off here in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So it was the perfect jacket to have. It packs into its own tiny pouch, and it folds out into a windbreaker. And mine is scarlet and gray, so I can rep my Buckeyes when I'm on the road. It has a magnetic upper layer with the sleeves that just pop off if I want it to be a vest, which I often do if I just want some pockets. From lightweight shirts to hoodies to jackets, their clothes are packed with pockets, even smart RFID blocking pockets, and they're designed with commuting in mind. Give them a look at scottyvest.com, and just by listening to this show, you get 15% off your order. Enter promo code TELLME, T-E-L-L-M-E, all one word, at scottyvest.com, promo code tell me, or just click the link in the show notes. I say it every week, believe it or not, virtual presentations are not going anywhere. I'm serious. Uh, I, I have a Zoom meeting as soon as I get home to talk about another virtual show. 
If you are still being asked to show up to work via Zoom, you might as well put some time and effort into making sure that you're presenting yourself in a way that lets people know you've got your stuff together. Check out Virtual Presenter Course. They have an easy to follow set of courses, teaches you everything from lighting to sound to backgrounds and more. They will teach you how to set up your home broadcasting studio so you'll stand out in your next online meeting. Even if that's just your office, they'll teach you how to make that space really stand out. They've agreed to give you 20% off just for listening to this show. Just go to virtualpresentercourse.com slash 30 and the discount will be automatically applied to your shopping cart. The link is in the show notes. I promise you're going to love this course. Let's get back to the show. So where did this tree thing start? Well, if you are a listener to this show, you know that the second part of this podcast is where I quiz a friend. And today we've got a great guest, but I thought it would be fun to quiz you first. So one of these answers is the true one. If you get it right, let me know you got it right. Send an email through the website and I'll send you a sticker in the mail. So here are your options. See if you can guess the right one without looking it up. A. It's a Scandinavian tradition relating to religion and appeasing tree-dwelling spirits. B. It's a legal requirement having to do with displacement of green space or trees that were knocked down in order to erect the building. C. It's an old English tradition going back to celebrating Christmas on top of the Palace of Windsor. What do you think? Do you know it? No Googling. Here's your answer. A lot of the origins of stories that we've covered on this podcast have their history in Old England, but this is not one of them, so it's not C. It's also not a legal thing. The correct answer was A. It's an ancient Scandinavian ritual. Here's the backstory. As I mentioned earlier, the ceremony is called topping out, and it's usually associated with raising the highest beam onto a building. The history of this one goes back to the 8th century, believe it or not. Now, back then they didn't always use trees. The earliest rituals placed sheaths of grain on top of the building. It's partly a way of saying, here, spirits of nature, we have displaced you, so we honor you by placing these pieces of nature on top of our construction. As it spread throughout Europe, it evolved into a tree, as the tradition, and it's based on the idea of humility. As we replace the natural landscape with these man-made structures, it's paying homage to the natural earth and the trees that will no longer live there. The reason they originally used sheaths of grain was to also feed Odin's horse Slepnir. In return, it was believed he would bestow good fortune upon the inhabitants of the building, the people that would be using that space. Throughout the years, different superstitions and meaning have been given to the tradition. For instance, some people believe that an evergreen tree should be used because it represents the hope for an everlasting life of the building. In different parts of the world, it's a different tree. In Australia, for instance, they might add some eucalyptus. In China, the tradition isn't observed with the tree, but there is a ceremony when construction begins that involves bowing to the project and a feast of a suckling pig. In Western culture, it's common to see a small evergreen tree hoisted onto the building, usually attached to the last steel beam, and it's also common to paint that beam white for signatures and include a large American flag. It's sort of a secular blessing of the building, like christening a ship. Some people believe that it's a way to congratulate the construction crew on a safe job. I didn't find anything speaking to whether or not they erect the tree when there were construction accidents. So that might be a thing uh, where some of the accounts that I found seem to suggest that they only erect the tree if no one was injured on the site. But I couldn't find, you know, any examples of if they didn't erect the tree when there were accidents. So if any of you listening work in the construction of buildings and you know about this, let us know. That is a piece of information I could not find. Uh, one other theory on the tradition's origins begins in Egypt where it's said that enslaved people who built the pyramids would place a tree on top of the pyramid to honor the people who died building it. But the one that seems to have the most documentation is that it all stems from appeasing the spirits of the woods in Scandinavia, the tree spirits who may have been displaced and angered. However, no word yet on what those spirits think about chopping down an additional tree. Now it's time for the part of the podcast where I call a friend, and today I'm calling Ama Marfo. 
Ama is a prolific writer and a professional speaker on group dynamics, leadership, and creativity. And she was on one of the very early episodes of this podcast. I'm so happy to have her back. What's up, Ama? It's great to have you back on my podcast. I am so excited to be back. Nice to see you again. What have you done between now and then? A lot of indoor stuff. Um, finished a couple TV shows. Uh, got really into watching things with people on Netflix party. That was probably the best part of my pandemic is like getting to share TV with people that way. I haven't done that. What does that entail? How does that work? So what it does is it's a plugin for Chrome that you can invite other people to watch something synchronously with you. So it essentially puts you in a room where you could watch like things on Netflix. I want to say Amazon Prime and Hulu. And you just get to share that experience and chat the way you would if you were in a room with friends. So I did it over 4th of July weekend last year because that was when Netflix's revival of the Baby Search Club came out. <laughs> so it was so nice to get to talk to other people who kind of grew up with those stories as well. And people who I wouldn't have been able to get in a room otherwise. Like I think at one point we did it on Saturday mornings. And at one point we had people from four countries watching together and like talking about their perceptions of the character, how they felt about the books growing up. And it was just really comforting wow. at a time that like we really needed that. So yeah. it'll like be I'm... harder to wrangle people for that. So I will miss it. It's a modern book club. It's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to try that. I haven't done it. I, I've almost missed my chance uh, because now we're going to be doing things in person here again. Uh, so the way that we do the podcast now is a little differently than before. Uh, when Last time you were on, we just sort of did an open chat. Uh, you were on the, the Boston Molasses Flood episode. Yes, and, I was. And uh, I chose you for that one because you are living in Boston. This one, uh, there's no no relation to the theme, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, this this is just something that, that came up that I found really interesting, and I have already quizzed our listeners on this, and now I'm going to quiz you. So for this first question, we are playing for some stakes. We're playing for the admission of a guilty pleasure movie, a movie that your friends will be embarrassed for you to have admitted. Okay. And if you get the question wrong, you'll have to tell us. If you get it right, I'll tell you one of mine. That seems fair. And I, I have several my brother and I got into a heated discussion last week about a couple of them. So uh, here's the question. What is likely the true origin of the tree that's sometimes placed upon newly constructed buildings? So sometimes when buildings are being built, you might see like a small tree on the top of them. I'll give you three choices of the, the real origin. A, okay. it's a Scandinavian tradition relating to religion and appeasing tree-dwelling spirits. B, it's a legal requirement having to do with the displacement of green space or trees that were knocked down in order to erect the building. Or C, it's an old English tradition going back to celebrating Christmas on top of the Palace of Windsor. Trying to think about which is most likely given what I know or understand of American history and where it derived from. So with that in mind, I like B as an answer, but I don't think that it's true. So I'm going to guess C. That is an amazing guess, but incorrect. Mm. Um, and, and it's interesting that you say that because so many of the origins of stories that I've done on this podcast go back to Old England. This one is, uh, A, it's a Scandinavian tradition relating to appeasing tree-dwelling spirits. It goes all the way back wow. to the 6th century. So we're talking the, the 500s. Uh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's an old, old tradition. I think it was sixth century. It might be even, it might be a little bit older than that. Um, but yeah, it's, and, and there are different theories on exactly what the mythology of the thing was, but what it seems to be is that they are basically appeasing their gods, appeasing the, uh, sorry, it's eighth century. Let me correct myself. So eighth century, uh, 700s. Yeah, it's, they're appeasing the tree dwelling spirits that they've displaced in building the building. It just feels like such a whimsical or impractical notion to put atop of something so practical. It is. That is why I'm so fascinated by this. That is a great way of putting it. It is pure superstition and tradition. And you think about like the construction workers that are building this building don't operate, can't operate on superstition or tradition, maybe some tradition. But I mean, we have to hope they don't from a, right. 
from a future occupation perspective, like, I hope that's not all they're going on. Yeah. And, and one of the more modern meanings of the tree being raised is it's sort of a celebration of a construction site without any injuries or deaths. I like that. Yeah, that's good, right? But he, I couldn't find anything about a, a building that was built with injuries or deaths that didn't do the tree, because that's what I want to see. I want to see, like, you know, that topping ceremony and there, you know, everyone's gathered around and there's a man on a podium who's like the, the guy who built the thing. And he just says, well, unfortunately, we can't put a tree on the beam today. Can't tell you why, but we just can't. Yeah. But, you know, it, I would love. So if anyone listening knows, I've, I've said this earlier, if anyone listening knows of that happening, let me know. Um, so do you have a guilty pleasure movie? So what I'll say is. Being someone who loves pop culture as much as I do, there aren't a whole lot of things that fall into the guilty pleasure in as much as I would feel badly about it. Um, or I, I will not be made to feel bad about most of the things that I enjoy. <laughs> but I think the closest that I would come to is, and you, you're old enough to probably remember the marketing blitz that surrounded this, because I definitely do, but the 1994 live action Flintstones. Oh my gosh, yes. With John yes. Goodman as Fred Flintstone, one of yep. the... Rosie La O'Donnell. Yeah, Rosie O'Donnell is Betty Rubble. Uh, Rick Moranis was one of the last times we saw him for a long while sure. as Barney Rubble. And I love it so much. Like, I've been traveling and, like, been on vacation or had an extra day, like, on a trip or something and, like, had it come on in the hotel. And it's like, well, I can't go out now. Like, that's how much I love it. I am most amazed at the fact that it came on. I haven't seen that since it came out i i've not seen it on television i don't know where i've been but uh, i don't watch a whole lot of television i'm pretty much all you know streaming stuff now but uh I, i've never in fact when you said it i had it took me a minute to go back and remember that th that existed that there was one and that performed horribly in yeah, the box it, office which was wild to me because i just remember marketing wise it being everywhere like it was in <laughs> mcdonald's placement like there were toys and like there's mcdonald's placement in the movie like it was all over the place like movie theaters had like cups for it like it was just this moment in time and like as somebody who later grew up to like study advertising and marketing like that's one of the very clear things that i remember of like everyone everywhere wanted you to know about this movie so the fact that it did so poorly i'm like well then what was it all for <laughs> i don't remember any of the marketing i would have been a freshman in high school so maybe that's why i don't remember anything is i just wasn't really in tune to the world <laughs> i was in tune to you know what goes on on a daily basis and marching band and that was about it so see i was a good bit younger i was third or fourth grade so yeah. like whatever was happening at mcdonald's this was like what was happening in the world so like <laughs> if they were talking about it i was like that's it then that what are we doing let's go see it <laughs> fantastic well for question number two if you get it wrong you'll have to tell me about the worst thing to ever happen to you during a show or at a talk at a college or wherever even a travel story if you get it right i'll tell you one of my horror stories deal okay you live in boston massachusetts which mm -hmm. one of these is the tallest building in downtown Boston. A, the Prudential Tower. B, the John Hancock Tower, 200 Clarendon Street. Or C, Nakatomi Plaza. I wish the answer were Nakatomi Plaza. I really do. I want that to be true. Um, I believe the Hancock is taller than the Prudential, so I'm going to say B. You are correct. The answer is the John Hancock Tower, which is now known as uh, 200 Clarendon Street. It's no longer called the John Hancock Tower. Not really sure why why that happened. Uh, normally, you know, if a building changes its name, it's because of some sort of sponsorship, but they just called it the address, which is very interesting. Uh, it's they like seven... calling buildings by addresses here. I'm not really sure when that started or why that is, but I like the idea of a really big building name for somebody with a really big signature, and we've lost that whimsy. <laughs> like, come on, man, that was fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you have to do a big signature if, if you want to be known to history as more important than all the other signers. People don't forget it. That's right. Uh, it's 790 feet tall. It was finished in 1976. It had a topping out ceremony five years before that. So the topping out was in 1971. The, the, uh, the finished product was opened in 76. Now, we covered this in the podcast, but I'll just tell you briefly, the topping out ceremony usually 
isn't done at the end of the, the finishing of the building. It's when they erect the top beam, whatever is the highest point of the building. When they erect that beam, that's when they do the topping out ceremony. I see. So, and then they bring the tree down uh, when they need to build around it, you know. All right. So, so you got that one right, which means I'll tell you one of my horror stories. Uh, oh this one happened in, I won't name the college, but it happened in Baltimore, Maryland at a college. And uh, it was Labor Day weekend. And I showed up to do the show. I had advanced the show. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, basically two weeks before I show up, I send an email or, or make a phone call that says, hey, I'm excited to come you know, do this, this show for you. Here are the things that we need to discuss just to make sure, you know, last minute, whatever those, those accommodations might be, whether it's, you know, do you need the, the tech writer so you know what I, what I need for the building. And I showed, and I, I advanced the show and everything was fine. I showed up. And there was no one there to greet me, which is fine. You know, that's happened before. It's like I got to wait on someone. So I called the number, no answer. And 20 minutes later, I called again, no answer. And finally, I got a text that says, call such and such name at this number. She's the contact for your show. I called that person and I said, hey, it's Michael Kent. I'm here for the show tonight. Uh, and she goes, I'm sorry, who? No idea who I was. What was going on? Oh, no. Uh, I sort of explained the situation to this person, and she said, okay, um, let me meet you. So this person met me, and I said, here's what I normally do. I normally go around the student union, and I do uh, you know, a teaser where I go around from, from table to table in the cafeteria area and tell people about the show. She had no idea what was going on. I show up in the student union and my name was on the calendar for that day. Like they had, you know, the events calendar, but okay. no info, no time, no building, nothing else. Ooh. And it was Labor Day weekend. So there weren't even many people on campus. Yeah. I went around and I basically scrounged up from scratch an audience of about 20 people. And I had campus security let me into the building, which wasn't open. The, you know, everything was locked. The theater was locked. The lights were off. No one there to do sound or lighting or anything. Ooh. I had to find my way around the theater to be able to turn the lights on, turn the sound on and everything myself. And uh, we did a show for about 20 people. And what, I, what had happened was the person who was in charge of the show was hospitalized, was very, very sick. Oh, no. And so sick that it was, it was uh, a serious issue where she didn't even have time to like say, hey, these are the contracts we have coming in. These are the people... Uh, you know, this is what you have to do. It was just kind of like drop everything and go. And mm -hmm. so that was, but I made, I made uh, the best of what I could. It was a weird situation <laughs> and nothing's yeah. ever happened like that since. So it sounds like you were very industrious under those circumstances. I, I, well, if I had just like, I, I couldn't just leave, you know, I'm being paid. And if I yeah. had just taken the money and, and, and not really done the work, I would have felt awful. And so I made the most of it, you know, I flew all the way to Baltimore to do the show. I was going to do something mm -hmm. and we made the most of it. And there were some people there that got entertained on Labor Day weekend. So it all, it all worked out. Excellent. Question three, the running prize for question number three is a sticker. Now, okay. traditionally it's been a sticker that says, tell me what to Google, but I have new stickers now. So now Ooh. I have actual stickers for the new name of the podcast, which is the internet says it's true. And you will win one of those stickers. Uh, if you get this right, if you don't get it right, uh, you don't get the sticker. There's no, there's no, uh, like, I don't have to send you a sticker. You don't have, well, if you have a sticker, it, I don't know if you have it. Do you have it like an Ama Marfo sticker? No, but I have other stickers. Okay. You can just send with, me like stuff sticker. I like, okay. I'll send you a, a random sticker of my choosing. <laughs> send me your most recent Apple sticker. Uh, okay. which they don't even give you anymore. I just bought a new iPhone. They didn't give you any sticker anymore. You have to buy a new charger or cord or whatever, and they don't give you stickers. Man, it's a yeah. mess. I had to buy the, they come, it comes with the cord. It doesn't come with the power block to plug the cord into the wall. That's a trick. Yeah, it is. It is. But the phone is amazing. So um, the tell me what to Google sticker, by the way, if you want those, if you're listening and you want to tell me what to Google sticker, you automatically get one when you join the Patreon. And I anticipate the high demand of the obsolete stickers will drive hundreds, literally hundreds of people to my Patreon. That sounds good to me. <laughs> Here's the question. When San Francisco's Bay Bridge was damaged from an earthquake in 1989, 
they repaired it and included a small superstitious token to one of the beams of the bridge to ward off evil spirits. Which one of these was it? A, a troll doll. B, a tiny fake bonsai tree. Or C, a lucky tiki necklace. Tiki necklace, if I'm remembering the Brady Bunch correctly, would have the opposite effect. And I would hope by 1989 they would still remember that. Bonsai tree feels very San Francisco. Like, troll feels very 80s, but bonsai tree feels very San Francisco. So I'm going to pick B. The answer is A, troll doll. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I love that. But can I just point out, I put the tiki necklace on here specifically because I thought that you might connect that to the Brady Bunch episode. <laughs> that is exactly why that's on here. Because yes. of your love for pop culture, I knew that you would get that. I put it on there because there was the Brady Bunch episode where it was supposed to be this good luck thing and it ended up being sort of an evil luck thing. So That makes me so happy that you did that. Because like I thought about it and I was like, should I say it? And I was like, I think I have to. So I'm glad I did. And I think there was another television show, maybe Friends, that had a, tiki, a bad luck tiki necklace which probably was an homage to to Brady Bunch, you know, to, to be honest. The troll doll, they had a tiny troll doll that was welded to the inside beam of the bridge away from public view. Its creator, uh, the, the, the bridge's creator, Bill Rowan, says it was there to protect the work. And he said, I like to think of him running around at night tightening the bolts, which is brilliant. Um, so I, I now I just want to find it. I want, an, I want someone yeah. to go and take a picture of this on the inside beam of the Bay Bridge. I love that. Uh, and because you got the tiki necklace reference, I'm going to send you a sticker anyway. So I'll take it. We'll, we'll call it a win. Cool. Question number four. Ama, you're originally from Tampa, and your Tampa Bay Lightning won their third Stanley Cup this week. Yes, they did. I'd like to think that that's thanks to David Savard, who you got from Columbus. Oh, sure. I would absolutely say that. In no small part, thanks to David Savard. So. Yes. I will, a, I will grant you that, and I will say thank you. I talked to friends from St. Louis yesterday. I said thank you for Pat Maroon. I'm, <laughs> I'm, put, I'm giving credit where credit is due. Sure, yeah. Savard had a, uh, he had an assist on that final game. He did. So uh, I thought that it'd be fun to do a question that combines your being a Bolts fan with the show topic. The Bolts home arena, Amelie Arena, opened in 1996 as the Ice Palace. Yes. At what height? Does the arena top out? In other words, how high is Emily Arena? You have three choices here. A, 133 feet, 10 inches. B, 249 feet. Or C, 301 feet, 3 inches. C feels like the weirdest answer, and Florida is an objectively weird place. So I'm going to pick C with no real other basis other than that. And like, weird number, weird place, that's my choice. The answer is a 133 feet 10 inches there was no way anyone would ever have known that but uh, i needed a question that that combined these two things and that one worked and that's and i'm also so glad you did we didn't play for stakes on this one because it's a silly question and there's no way anyone would know that that's also a weird number so i think my reasoning stands i just picked the wrong number <laughs> yeah the reasoning works uh so a couple facts about that building it encompasses 670,000 square feet with three decks and seven separate levels. Uh, it's 493 feet in diameter. It was built with 3,400 tons of steel, 30,000 cubic yards of concrete, and 70,000 square feet of glass. Hmm. And one of the coolest arenas, I would love to watch a game there because when you watch the games there, it seems very like high tech and very crowd oriented. It's kind of like mm -hmm. some of the, which is surprising because it's an older stadium, but. Some of the newer stadiums like Nashville and uh, and Vegas do so many cool fan experience things, and Tampa Bay seems to do that as well. Yeah, they've done a good number of upgrades over the years, and like I have a family friend that's the in uh, in arena announcer, and then another friend of mine that I used to work with that does like some of the in game entertainment, and they've put a lot into it. Like I really miss watching games there, and I hope I will get to do it again soon. You have a family friend who's an uh, an announcer at the games. Yep. So like whenever we hear him on TV, I'm like, that's Paul. I know him. That's so cool. That's like a dream job. I would love. And has, now taking the ice, you're, you know, Tampa he has a Bay great, Light. just to listen to him talk is so fun. Oh, that's awesome. so fun. Does he, does he talk like the way that he announces 
A little. Like Mama, not everything. So good to see you again. <laughs> It's a little bit. It's less dramatic unless something dramatic is happening. But most of the time, it's just regular Paul voice. We've run out of ice at the party. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, so you're one for four. But these were specifically uh, th these were particularly tough questions this week. They're very, very strange questions. And I use this quiz to just provide additional info about the topic. Usually uh, these things are just kind of like, oh, I found this and it's interesting. So question number five is for all the marbles. If okay. you get this wrong, I'm banning you from the show never to be asked on again. I can live with that. <laughs> and all my other shows too. You were on uh, Joke Story Trick as well. Yes. Oh, so, I get banned from all of them. All of them. Yeah. Well, Joke Story Trick, I, I haven't. I, I stopped doing after okay. 60 episodes. We we called that one quits. Uh, assuming we get the Delta variant under control and people continue getting vaccinated, what will you miss most about the pandemic? It's a good question. And I think obviously there's a lot to not miss. I will say my answer is wearing pants that don't have like buckles, snaps, or zippers. Mm. I'm really really enjoying that and like right now it's dress season so i can expand that a little bit but by fall i'm gonna have to make some decisions i'm a little bit stressed out about it <laughs> like it's gotten too good i've worn jeans once since march 9th 2020 and i'll tell you i did not care for it really did not care for it that's fantastic i i wear jeans at home i'm i'm that weirdo i used to be in jeans i used to be but what happened i don't know i'm not sure i think i got comfortable and then got very comfortable and I'm now having a hard time leaning back into that discomfort. If you had these two choices, what would you choose? If you had to choose between one of these, if you were never ever allowed to wear sweats again, or you had to only wear sweats every day for the rest of your life. Um, do I have like choices and styles of sweats or is it like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we've come a long way there. So I think I would prefer to wear them with the understanding that the technology and fashion would advance in such a way that I wouldn't get bored with it. Yeah. You could be like, these aren't sweats. These are yoga pants and they're socially acceptable. Exactly. Exactly. Totally. I've, I've really had to reevaluate the leggings, pants, stance. Like I came out real hot on that before. And I'm like, you know what? But I just take some of that for fear or back. I do. I, re I remember the pushback to that and i was in that camp as well i remember i remember being one of those people that like you know uh leggings aren't pants or yoga pants aren't you aren't socially acceptable and then it was like a year and then everyone was doing it and it was like okay yeah that's cool yeah it's it, generally speaking is not the decision i would make but like if i'm in the house and don't have anywhere to be like who cares not me it's how it's how society also reacted to women wearing pants probably sure yeah. <laughs> you know, when women started wearing pants, men were angry and then they were like, okay, yeah, it's a thing. It's like, oh, it doesn't affect me in any way. <laughs> Neat. Like, now I don't if know. We could, if we could just all think that about every other decision about women. <laughs> wouldn't that be great? Just treat be... it like you did with pants. It was a problem for like 20 minutes and then it didn't affect you and you got over it. And that right. could be true for anything. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes. Society just is going to move on without you. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can people find out more about you? So my website is amamarfo.com. So that's where all the information about my speaking, where I'll be next uh, is. And then I'm also at amamarfo, all one word, on Twitter and Instagram. And that is way sillier, but I like to think it's all me, just slightly different versions. It's A-M-M-A-M-A-R-F-O, I'm a Marfo. What, uh, what show do you have coming up tonight? It's a King of the Hill recap podcast called Ho Yeah. And I have like wrangled my way into doing the episodes where they talk about like Bobby doing comedy. So <laughs> this week we're doing the episode where he kind of starts the propane themed improv troupe. And I'm like, please let me talk about it. So I'm very excited to chat with them about that. What's the name of that podcast? It's called Ho Ya, a King of the Hill podcast. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for joining me this week. And I hope to have you back soon. Now that I know I'm not banned, I would happy to be back anytime soon. Yes. <laughs> well, that is all for this week. Thank you to Brian for the show topic, to Ama Marfo for being my guest. And thanks to you for continuing to listen and support this podcast. 
Here is something we recorded at Take Your Kid to Work Day at Dunder Mifflin. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. Don't forget to join up on Patreon if you want to see the unedited video of the guest appearance or to hear bonus episodes. You can do that at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. Also, if you learned something that you didn't already know from the show, please visit iTunes and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That's the rule. You gotta do it. That helps us a ton because that's how the algorithm works to get the podcast suggested to more people. And that way we can keep learning something new. If the internet says it's true. The internet says it's true. would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help make this show possible. Sean Brown, Catherine Morgan, Taylor Hurt, Tony Ford, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Matt McVeigh, Jim Martin, Joanne Martin, Josh Van Allen, and this show's official emperor, KickTrack. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and additional music this week was from Asher Furlero. All audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17 U.S.C. Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Kent.